Police Commissioner Michael Cox, and you know, welcome. So a few weeks ago, I think we started off having uh, um, you know more briefings and conversations about how do we keep you all better informed uh, about what we're doing. Uh, today, we're going to focus on w one conversation which brought us here to the school uh, on an initiative which will help explain. Uh, the mayor will help explain it a little bit further, but it's about a, a violence reduction workshop uh, meeting that we just had today where uh, the city came together with many of our nonprofit faith-based uh, leaders, so many different leaders in the city to talk about a way or, uh, to reduce violence in Boston. The police department has a long history of being involved in and at least trying to lead the way around public safety and violence reduction. And I don't know how successful that's always been. And I think today's workshop is really about are we doing everything in our power to uh, evolve and how do we address the issues that drive violence in general. And one of the things we know is that, you know, police aren't the answer. We can't do it in that way. And so the mayor is good enough to, to bring together, uh, you know, all of us uh, under the leadership of uh, uh, Dr. App. And so we can talk about, and the workshop is going to be for several days, uh, talk about ways in which we can work to partner and address all the issues uh, that drive violence, that uh, created it, or, or conditions that create it in the communities that we serve here. And so. I'm going to bring the mirror up in a, in a moment to talk a little bit more about it, but that's been really the focus of uh, our meeting here today, and I'm looking forward to the opportunity to certainly partner with everyone in the city uh, to do all we can to reduce gun violence and do all we can to evolve as a police department, because regardless of what we may think, you know, we are in a different era in some way, shape, or form. Uh, we had the Boston Miracle uh, quite a long time ago, but the reality is coming off a post-pandemic, are we living in a little different world today? And so we need to do all we can to partner with the, everyone, who, all the stakeholders in the city to make sure that we respond appropriately for today's issues and problems um, to resolve them. So I'm going to bring the mayor up and she can elaborate a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, can everyone hear okay? It's sounding echoey. Okay. Um, and I want to invite up the rep and any other elected officials who, who might be in the room who wish to join us. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank Mr. Jackson and all the team at the Tobin for hosting us here uh, today for this workshop, but also for, for being a home for so many of our young people in life-changing ways. Uh, many of the Tobin kids who came up through these, these spaces, through this gym, through the, uh, the loving spaces all throughout this building are now serving in city leadership, are running BCYF and, and other posts, um, and so we're so grateful and know the life-changing work that happens in this space. I want to thank the Commissioner also for uh, making sure that there is a regular, proactive, transparent commitment to ensuring that we're getting information out. So this is part of his regular uh, press briefing that we're all kind of hopping onto and uh, thankful to him for taking part in the workshop and therefore you all coming to meet us where we were already were today at this. Oh, and invite up Chief Masso um, here as well. So I, I'm here mostly to um, thank and introduce the other leaders who are going to say a little bit of what we're doing today and over the next couple days. Um, Chief Long, come on up as well. Okay, everyone keeps trickling in. Superintendent, <laughs> anyone wants to come up? Come join us up here. Um, Boston, as we all know, is a national model for community safety, for violence prevention and interruption, and we continue to have our own homegrown expertise community organizations, leaders who are standing with us here and, and taking part in this regularly going all across the country to share how to do it right and how to engage community and how to make sure that we are getting to the root of challenges. Um, we know that Boston is also one of the safest large cities in the country, but I am here to emphasize that historic lows are not good enough when it comes to public safety incidents, we are committed to eradicating violence in our communities, in every neighborhood, in every part of our city. And we know that we can only do that 
if we are following and working alongside and uh, really targeted in our approaches right alongside community. And so the workshop that we are very grateful to take part in, this is Boston is among a cohort of cities that will be able to access expertise from all around the country and facilitation that makes sure that our expertise, uh, the solutions that we have here that we know are already making a difference can be coordinated and pushed into a larger plan that we can act on long after our um, visitors are, are uh, moving on to other cities, we will be here, we will be doing the work, and we will stay committed to that work. And so uh, we had a couple sessions already this morning just about some of the data and numbers where Boston is today, uh, about the specific trends and information that we have been seeing, and about the work that has been happening from the Boston Police Department, Public Health Agency, and all of the community partners who were in the room. We will continue to push and make sure that we are all on the same page um, and have a clear coordinated effort to do even more than ever before. Part of that work will also be launching a citywide uh, healing tour. Uh, we are partnering with some community members on this, so in addition to our senior advisor for community safety, Isaac Yablo, um, Jimmy Hills is, is taking the lead on community side and really making sure we're engaging all of our residents and especially those who have been doing this for a long time and, and centered in um, the, the leadership that we see from community. And so that will kick off in the next little bit. Um, and come on up, Jimmy, too. We'll invite him to share a few words on that as well. Uh, and then before I pass it on, not everyone up here is going to uh, chime in proactively, but are all up here for questions and to be responsive. So I do want to introduce again our Chief of Human Services, Jose Masso, Senior Advisor for Community Safety, Isaac Yablo, our District Attorney, uh, Kevin Hayden, uh, Chapl Cle Chaplain Clementina Sherry for, from the Louis D. Brown Peace Institute, who will speak shortly. Um, you, so you know the commissioner, <laughs> Reverend Jeffrey Brown, who is a national leader and helped uh, really catalyze and ground us in the foundation of this work from uh, the historic 12th Baptist Church, who you'll also hear from shortly, Superintendent Mary Skipper, thank you, thank you, State Representative Chris Farrell, Superintendent Chief Greg Long, and um, the Java with Jimmy, Jimmy Hill. <laughs> so I'll pass it on to Reverend Brown now to say a few words. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Reverend Jeffrey Brown. I'm associate pastor of the historic 12th Baptist Church in Boston, where senior pastor is the Reverend Willie Bodrick II. And I've been here as a, a part of this convening of not only uh, academics, stakeholders, but also uh, practitioners uh, from all stripes in the city that have been dedicating their lives to seeing a safer city and um, reducing violence in our communities. Uh, and it was, in my opinion, a very good session. We had folks who opened up their hearts and talked about issues um, that they have dealt with uh, around violence, the process of convenings, because this is not the first time we've put all these convenings together. But there was something different about this one because there are folks who are hopeful because this administration is one that has been really responsive to the needs of the community. And so there's hope that in this iteration that we'll be able to see something that we haven't seen before, and that is the end of the era of violence in our communities. I know that my friend Tina Cherry, uh, who has been at this for as long as I have, uh, will, will speak, but there is something that she says uh, that always moves me, and that is there's a difference between the system's peace and God's peace. And what the people in the community are looking for is God's peace, which is a true peace in which folks will be able to live and raise their children and uh, build their lives uh, free of violence. We have an administration that is committed uh, to doing that, to improving lives for everyone in the city, because if there are a few that are still suffering, then the city itself suffers. And she believes that uh, by pulling all of this together, that we'll have hope in order to make that happen. And we have come together, 
and I'm grateful to uh, Tom Apt and his group at the University of Maryland. Uh, I remember him from the Obama administration with the Violence Prevention Network that we put together at the Department of Justice. Uh, we've, we've, got the, we've got the learning and we also have the burning to make sure that we can bring peace to the city of Boston. We're in the vanguard in terms of violence prevention in the country, but if people still measure violence from their front porches or their back stoops, then we still have a lot of work to do. So we're going to be able to come together, we're going to check our egos at the door, and we're going to see the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And so thank you, Mayor. Uh, so why don't I just name the order so I don't have to keep coming back up here. I'll invite up um, Chaplain Cherry, then James Hills, then our um, District Attorney, Superintendent, and then we'll hand up, uh, State Representative, then we'll hand it back to the Commissioner to get to all of the, the other stuff that was on his uh, press conference agenda that we have taken over. Thank you. Good afternoon, Boston. Come on, let's celebrate this. This is historic moment. Um, I have some notes, yet I'm going to not focus on those notes because now I can't find them. So I'm here over 30 years in doing this work. When Lewis was killed in 1994, there were really no resources in the city of Boston to assist families whose loved ones have been gunned down on our streets. Yet over the last three decades, we have worked with our hospitals, with our police department, with our district attorney's office, with our mayor's office, to really begin to respond effective and equitable to families impacted by gun violence, including those involved in police shooting. If we're talking about peace within our city, Responding to those impacted has to be central to this. Because when we don't, research tells us that the cycle of retaliatory violence continues. So it's an honor to be here. It's a struggle also to be here. So I'm in my humanity and in my spirituality because I've been down this road before. Late Mayor Menino administration, Walsh administration, Janey administration, and now the Wu. Each administration has its own. The difference with this administration, our mayor, who clearly says, I don't have the answers. Our police commissioner, who clearly says, I can't do it alone. So they're saying it, and they're inviting us. So I've made that recommitment to come back to the table. Many of you know us for the Mother's Day Walk for Peace, yet we do more than that. So a part of our work, we've met with the mayor privately, we've met with the police commissioner, and we're meeting with their administration. I've said this to her privately, and I will say it publicly. We can't blame her for the mess in our city. She inherited this mess. And within our community, we are doing what we can do to make sure that we transfer how we are viewed as community where bad things happen to communities where good things happen. We want to transfer that narrative from the problem to the solution. 30 years since my son was killed on the streets of Boston, Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan are the same hotspots. The victim were not even born, and those that are causing the harm were not even born. What this mayor is doing and what this administration is doing is including communities, making sure that there's support for the families that are impacted on both sides. My counterpart, Ruth Rollins of We Are Better Together, is doing exactly that, making sure that the families of those who are incarcerated and coming back, that the families can begin to heal. Peace 
and healing are central to what we are doing. When a homicide happens because of our partnership with the city of Boston and the hospitals and the Boston Neighborhood Trauma Team, under the leadership of Stephanie Boston, our Survivors um, Outreach Services Manager, they make sure that within that first 24 to 72 hours, that family is connected to us so they can begin to bury their loved one with dignity and compassion, regardless of the circumstances. While we're looking at intervention, we also want to make sure that families are central because gun violence is still happening. While our numbers are low, what I am here and want to make sure that when you guys report that the numbers are low and we celebrate that, but for each victim, that number of survivors has just risen. So the survivors community continues to rise as we go on. So I want to thank you again. I've said it to you guys. You have got my commitment. I want to end. We talked about the Boston miracle. In 1996, former Attorney General Janet Reno's report, One City Success Story. The Lewis D. Brown Peace Curriculum was one of those programs she cited that contributed to the reduction of juvenile crime in the city of Boston. That's where we started with this work, with the Boston Public School, teaching peace through literature and community service learning. The first curriculum in the country that included the teaching of loss and grief as part of our children's social skills. Now they call it social emotional learning. So a tool that the students put together is Boston's Book of Peace, seven volumes. And I want to really gift those seven volumes to the city of Boston to see where those young people were 30 years ago and where they are now and to make sure that we bring their voices into this as we begin to heal and create the peace of the city that we are all seeking. Thank you so much and God bless you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is James Hills. I'm the host of Java with Jimmy, but more than that, I'm a community resident that has spent 40 years. I count my time as a peer educator in Bromley Heath Housing Projects at the age of 11. What we're about to just mention very quick, and I am not a peer by myself and the two community partners that have worked with me, I must name them. That is Darnell Singleton of DS Consulting and also Ramilda Piera of Project Turnaround. Since October, um, we've been meeting with some city officials and talking, and out of that has come something that is coming to the community called the Healing Tour. Um, it will consist of phases, and we will go into communities through a collaboration with uh, the numbers from the police department, also definitely with Dr. Yablo um, and the neighborhood trauma team. And according to data, we'll go into four neighborhoods three times and meet with the community. The ultimate goal of the healing tour, and, and it was named in our workshop and data downstairs, is that we bring the ownership of the improved quality of life back into community, but supported by the city. So it will be citizen-led, but supported by the city. And we are working out the kinks. Our mayor has done real well at um, attempting to dismantle and, and work around uh, systems and structures. And it is imperative, and I don't know if any of our council folks are here, but it is imperative that somehow we figure out a way to allow the administration to do what it is that they need to do without systems and structures that somewhat, there's accountability, but we also need the flexibility when you have an administration that wants to, but is then limited by what's in city charter and RFPs and all that other stuff. And so it is important that we continue with this work the next couple of days. But then out of that, the healing tour is a part of a multifaceted approach that community needs to own and lead. The city supports along with the other initiatives that Dr. Yablo, Human Services, who else is up here? Boston Public Schools and BPD are working on. And so listen out for the healing tour. The dates are coming. We're going to different locations in the city. And the purpose, let me be clear, 
The purpose of the healing tour, yes, we'll name the issues and we'll name our trauma and what we're dealing with, but we want to get back to the village. And the city has demonstrated with where they can, with the systems and structures that need to be dismantled there, their commitment to supporting that. And so we really appreciate it. And Mayor, I thank you for being like uh, Reverend uh, Sherry, been through a few administrations, um, and this has been one, without disregarding the work and commitment of the others, this present one has been the one that has demonstrated sort of a yes, I don't know, but come on and let me know with working within the structures that confine you. So city council and others, and it has to go up home petition and all of that, give this woman in administration the freedom she needs to do what she needs to do. Thank you. I guess I'm next. Good, good afternoon, everybody. It's, uh, it's good to see everyone here today. Um, it's been even more encouraging and powerful uh, to see the group that was uh, with us this morning talking about violence reduction um, in Boston and the things that we need to do to continue to lay hold of this problem. You know, Boston has always, historically, going way back, led this entire nation when it comes to intervention and prevention strategies, when it comes to violence reduction, when it comes to addressing uh, the crime that at times can plague our communities. But the strength of Boston is in our communities. The strength of Boston is in our communities and in our, in our collaboration and our ability to work together, as you see here witnessed again today. One of the things that I heard this morning I think is vitally important, and it's been repeated, and I've been saying this um, since I began office. We have to remember that criminal legal reform and public safety, and a lot of things that go along with that, like returning citizens, like dealing with trauma, deep-seated trauma in our communities, criminal legal reform and advancing public safety has to happen together at the same time. There's no other way, and our communities demand just that. If we don't do both at the same time, we will never achieve the goals that we strive for and that we talk about here today. It is vitally important that we remember that. The notion that they can't go together is not true, and there's a myth that says that, 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 that it is true, that they're mutually exclusive, and they're not. We have to advance both at the same time and do both at the same time together in collaboration with each other and with our communities to really make the difference. Boston has led the way. I talked earlier about this, the, the, the partnerships from the past that have made the difference. I talked a little bit about the Boston Miracle. Well, here's the thing about the Boston Miracle, and here's where we are. And we've talked about it earlier when we talk about how low crime is right now. You think that's an accident? We got to where we are because of where we've been, because of the miracles and some of the successes that we've been through. But we will never rest and we will never stop. Because we're not here for a miracle, a momentary pause in crime and violence. We're here for deliverance. In Boston, deliverance is possible. And we're going to keep going and keep striving and keep doing everything we can until real deliverance from violent crime is realized in our city, not just parts of our city, but every part of our city. The Blue Hill Avenue corridor, where those who are uh, marginalized and diminished are safe as well. We cannot rest, and we will not rest, until this entire city is safe from violent crime. Thank you. Good afternoon. We just want to express our appreciation, Boston Public Schools, to be part of today. Um, thank you to the mayor and to the commissioner and to Dr. Yablo for the invitation. I think it's a very powerful conversation that we started to engage in. You know, I, I think it's symbolic that we're doing this, you know, the violence reduction workshop in a community center because it's right next door in a budding school. And I think what we have to realize is that that sacred bond between the community and our youth is there every day. Our priority is to keep our students safe every minute that they're with us, but they're not with us every minute. The after schools, the evenings, the weekends, the summer, 
that's when the community picks up and embraces our children. And so we're at a point where to come together and the hope that we express downstairs to do so, to work across our agencies, to work across and with our community, I think is going to be critical in extending our arms as a community around our youth, keeping them safe and keeping everyone else safe. So again, we appreciate it and it was really a powerful morning. Thank you, everyone. And so um, the importance of uh, certainly the meeting we just talked about is, is you know, is, is from a police standpoint is, you know, we are, part, we are practicing community policing, and in order for us to be successful, we have to partner with as many people as possible and get feedback from the public on, on how we go about doing their job and in realizing what the issues of, that, are, that exist today to partner with as many pop people as possible to address those issues around that. Um, and, you know, from a law enforcement perspective, you know, we are always here to support with the traditional tools that we have, but those tools have never proven to totally win out or solve problems and issues. And so I want to thank the mayor for bringing us together uh, as we start to um, partner in, in a very large way, particularly for the upcoming summer months here to address, uh, you know, crime reduction in the city of Boston. And so uh, we started this off today by talking about a, a little, a little uh, press conference about what we're doing. And then I got a little distracted, so give me a second here. And um, yeah, so I guess uh, next week we will talk a little bit more about the upcoming Boston Marathon. Make sure that uh, we, we go through our, our public safety plan and, and inform the public on some of the measures we have in place to keep everyone safe. Uh, for that certainly family friendly traditional event, uh, I know that this year uh, has a certain significance being the 10 year anniversary of I mean, uh, the, the, the bombing. But rest assured that we, along with all our federal and state partners, are going to do all we can to keep people safe in general. And we'll go over that a little bit more next week. As far as crime is concerned, our robbery attempts are up year to date, 177 from 146 in 22. Uh, this is largely due to, a, we had a series of four robberies in the city that probably drove most of those numbers. And outside of this, maybe if you want to do follow up, we can explain what that is. Uh, we arrested recently a, a Royal Benjamin of Cambridge, who was arrested on Monday, March 27th by the Youth Violence Strike Force, uh, out a warrant out of Roxbury uh, for an armed robbery, uh, a mask, uh, um, he, he had uh, done a few in general, and uh, this, this happened thanks to the incredible work that our youth, our youth violent strike force, as well as our federal and state partners who, who work with us to uh, make these arrests. Um, you know, the BRIC, uh, we have some anal an analysts in the BRIC, and they've done a tremendous job doing analysis of some of the robberies and things that have happened in, in, in the area where by connecting the dots, uh, it gave us uh, the ability to see connections and patterns, which ultimately ended up in us uh, making that arrest I just made reference to a little bit earlier. As far as homicides are concerned, you know, we have 11 homicides right now in 2023, which is six more than we had last year. And um, five, uh, for the five-year uh, average, uh, it is nine below, uh, above what we normally have. We've made arrests so far this year in the homicides that have happened in five arrests and, and looking forward to making some other ones here in, in the recent future coming up. Uh, that's about all the prepared notes I had. You know, today's uh, events were, you know, as tremendous as the seminar goes on. Uh, maybe we can elaborate a little bit more about what we're finding. But uh, I think the, the overall, uh, uh, the fact that we came together, the fact that we're talking, looking from a perspective of a long period of time of data, uh, you know, this, this, this venue is not just us coming together, but we're also coming together and looking at data and being data informed about some of this stuff and making sure that we're interpreting the data right and, and figuring out how can we work together as a community to make sure that we reduce things. So I will take some questions if you have some. It's the opportunity to hear from all of you and ask questions. We talk a lot about transparency and evolving as a department. Two homicides of the 11 you just mentioned had a difficult time getting information about them. And in, in fact, the public says they had two. One was a, a man who had his throat slashed 
in a West End apartment. The public didn't find out until a month later. Another was an assault in downtown crossing where the public was finding out from us and they still didn't know that that man had passed away until we told them. So can you tell me at what point did these incidents rise to the level that the public needs to be informed and what your department is doing to work on transparency? Yeah, so, I mean, this is helpful right now as talking about it. I can't speak to the first incident because, uh, unfortunately, we do have some incidents here and, and I'm not uh, readily able to talk about that right now. Another incident, it just really was about being, how it was reported to us and then how we followed up on those investigations. It was a little bit of a time lag behind that. Um, you know, homicides are, are uh, those are the most horrific crimes we have. And, I'd have to say that we're probably typically the most transparent about that in general, where uh, we, you know we, we put out the information when we have it. There's nothing to hide around that. Um, and so if we do have an issue around timeliness, you know, I will certainly, from this point on, look into some of the things you just said just to see what it is and maybe answer it the next time we come together uh, in a little bit more informed way. What can you say to the public, specifically at the apartment? I know you don't know a no. lot about it. But we did reach out to the DA's office about that one because they announced the arrest, and that's when we figured out that it even had happened. And so for a month, these people living out of the were like, what? Someone broke in, slashed them in the throat, slept on their couch, ate their food? I mean, what can you say to the public about that? Because it rises to the level that they're concerned about it. Yeah, so again, I'm at a disadvantage right now because you're, you know, you're citing something that I am not familiar with you know, totally to be able to answer it appropriately. But the, f the fact is, is that, you know, um, you know, it sounds like the crime was horrific, if it's as you described it. More importantly, we arrested the person. I think that is the thing that the public should walk away with, it, that that person won't offend again. And then we need to do more in any way possible to make sure that it doesn't happen in, in general. You know, prevention is what we're here for. Partnering with folks to make sure this stuff doesn't happen in the city, that's what we're here for in so many ways. Uh, if there was a lack of transparency, it was probably something that maybe fell through a crack and not something certainly intentional because our focus and effort is always about making sure if we can't prevent it, then making sure that we capture the person so they don't offend again. And it sounds like that we did that in this case. So, knowledge is important. It absolutely is. Uh, but again, I, it's hard for me to elaborate on something without having the full information around that. So, um, I will engage this conversation after I get briefed a little bit more. Uh, the, the victim was apparently near an ATM. Just so we understand, you know, what happened, uh, that's an area that is frequented by a lot of homeless people, people sleeping in doorways. Was this someone who, because of their unfortunate circumstances, found themselves in, in a, a situation where they're randomly uh, at risk of being a victim? Or was this someone on their way to a restaurant, on their way home to one of the expensive high rises in the neighborhood? Well, the good thing, the DA is right behind me, but the fact is, um, you know, all those facts and circumstances will be brought out, you know, certainly if we make an arrest and at a trial. Oh, do you feel comfortable? And yeah. you might you, and you might not even be aware because well, I Well, you know, I, here's, here's what I'll say generally, and I think this is what people need to understand. Um, we always endeavor to be transparent in every single case. Um, uh, anyone here in this room knows you've seen both me and the commissioner have seen time and time again. But there are times where we have to be very careful and sensitive to make sure that what we disclose does not jeopardize the case. For example, we made an arrest in that case that you talk about. Depending on how transparent we have been, how might it have been different? We don't know. We're always going to do everything we can to ensure public safety um, and to solve crimes um, and to do the best we can and as transparently as possible. But there are times where the integrity of investigations and the sensitivity of the uh, evidence and the information that we're dealing with that we can't always disclose that information. And we have to ask you, both the media and the public, to understand that and to understand that we are always doing everything we can to solve these crimes and endeavor to solve them. Uh, but sometimes uh, discretion can be the better part of valor. I don't know if that, that, doesn't, that answer your question, but more to yours. But something about that, and there are scant details, and they wonder whether, I don't know, not even frequent that part of the city. 
or whether there's some other explanation where the circumstances are tragic for the individual involved, but it's a totally different, you know, picture of what happened. So I, I'll, I'll say this about that. If there's something that the public needs to be in danger of, we're going to tell you, right, that this is important. If there's a person out there who's victimizing folks and we have a reason to believe there's a pattern of it, we're going to put it out there in general because that is our, our role and goal is to make sure people are safe. That is what you should absolutely know. Um, I think sometimes, you know, people get concerned about, oh, what, what should I know? When we know information that, that the public could actually be in harm's way, we put that out as soon as possible, and we will talk about that, right? Uh, that is what transparency is for, is to make sure the community is safe around that. Uh, and, and that is what we, we, we try to do around that. So the DA made, made reference to, you know, maybe sometimes something's not put out or not. If, it, if it, that's the case, it's because we don't believe that the, the public is in, in jeopardy around that, and it's probably about part of an investigation. But rest assured, if something happens and we believe that the public should know immediately because they're in harm's way, we will tell them immediately. Because I, I want to emphasize that, you know, I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, because people should know the fact is, is that if we haven't told you about it, it, it you know, then it's highly likely that it's not that kind of um, thing, if, we know, if we're aware. Let's put it that way, if we're aware. And so, um, you know, I, I just want to answer the question in that way, if that's helpful. Next question. Chaplain really oh, Cherry yeah. and Isaac wanted to add on that last question, oh. too. Thank you. I, I, I'm not the commissioner. I know your questions are not geared at me. I'm not the district attorney. I know your questions are not geared at me. This is for me as a mother whose child was murdered in the city of Boston. When the reports came out, it's about certain places violence happens, and it's okay that it happens. In other places, these things are not supposed to happen. So I get it, the public wants to know, but when you report that, when you say, the community doesn't have to worry about it because it's an isolated issue, or these things are supposed to happen in this community. When you make that statement, you demonize, you minimize the lives that was taken, and you re-traumatize. So I think, yes, you want to know more, and sometimes with wanting to know more, it's again, You've said, without saying, you've said in this area it's good to be, there are bad people in this area, so we have to protect this area. Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan, as long as it stays in that area, then we want to report in that. So I think as we continue to do this, as a mother whose child was murdered, and the person convicted of killing my son is the son of a Boston police officer. We are losing at both ends of that goddamn gun. So I, I, I invite you guys, as you're reporting, think about, because that victim belongs to somebody and we don't know what they're going through. My son, Geneva Ave, he was walking to the train station. What were we told? These things happen within the community. Unfortunately, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. When you make that statement, you have just justified why bad things happen in certain places and then why resources don't come to the families impacted. So I get it. I get it. But let's just do just a little bit deeper to, again, how do we make sure the family, that family that has just been re-triggered, re-traumatized, re-victimized in a city that's called their city, to make sure that they have the resources that they need in that immediate and connected to the healing. The investigation will come because we want you to keep pressure on them. We want you to keep pressure on them to ask the hard question, but in those initial phases, as a mother whose child was murdered, and then watch the mother of the person convicted of killing my son suffer that shame, stigma, and pain. So within our city, we're losing at both ends. And we just invite you to 
be more aware of when you report and what information you want to have and how you're reporting. Commissioner, I want to apologize for just stepping in, but when I hear those questions, my heart, it just breaks. And, 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 and the anger and the frustration because we're re-victimizing. And then we're saying who's worthy and who's not worthy. And I know that's not your intention. So I'm going to step back. Uh, I'll be very brief, and I just want to add what the typical pro process is and protocol uh, when there is a tragedy in the community. So in regards to the West End uh, situation, we did have a community meeting with everyone in the building um, within 72 hours of the event taking place at the time. Uh, captain Martin was a new captain of, of the Area A1 um, precinct, and, and we worked in collaboration with the Boston Police Department with the Neighborhood Trauma Team. I was accompanied by Donald Osgood, um, who's serving as the interim director of the Neighborhood Trauma Team. So uh, all of us have been working together, and that is the standard protocol uh, when there is a tragedy in the community. Last question. Yeah, I have a question um, this is both for the police commissioner, but also for anybody up here um, that has thoughts on this. We were, had heard earlier today, um, and have been talking for a while about how youth violence is up, specifically um, young people carrying guns is up. Um, and while it's too soon to say, it, it seems like that might be something that is Boston specific, or at the very least, is happening here and not in other cities. Is there a sense, A, of, of why that's the case, why we're seeing the age get younger and younger, um, but also if there's a sense of how many of those young people are carrying guns for protection? Yeah, so I. I think you were, you know, participated for a hot second. So we, there was some data on there about youth violence, and I think what the data said is that uh, youth activity in, in some of the, you know, driving the, maybe some of the homicides and things are maybe similar, but the arrest of youth, youth with carrying firearms has gone up tremendously, almost 100 percent in the last, my, I think, maybe four or five years. And so it is concerning. Um, you know, clearly we need to do some more research on the reasons why, but I would also say that I would think that the number of guns in this country has exponentially gone up in that same period of time. Uh, I, I, I think there's a lot of factors involved of which this is why, you know, the mayor you know, brought together such a diverse group of people to talk about some of the drivers of this. And, and that's exactly why we're meeting to talk about trying to figure out how can we intervene to keep them from picking up a gun in the first place. So, thank you.